Hey, I'm pleased to say I am here with Mo Furster, the co-founder of Hyrox. Thanks for joining us, Mo. Thank you very much for having me. Right, so uh, before we get into all the, the Hyrox okay. questions and, and, and so on, do, if, for people that don't know, can you just tell us a brief bit about your history and, you know, what you did before Hyrox and, and, the, and then we'll get into it? Uh, absolutely, sure. Um, so I... In my former life, as I usually say, I was playing field hockey as a professional sport. That that was basically my life, um, uh, kind of in a professional way, although it's not an officially professional sport in Germany. But actually, the only difference is money. So um, it was pretty professional from the training circumstances and everything. Um, I did this. I participated in three Olympic Games in uh, Beijing, London and the Rio Olympics. And um, yeah, as I said, that was, that was all I did for the between 2000 and uh, 2018, more or less. Uh, although, um, yeah, the second second career uh, is, at least in this uh, viewer or listenership, I guess, uh, also known because uh, then in 2017, in March, I founded the company with uh, Christian Tötzke and Michael Troutman. Uh, back in the days, Christian, obviously one of the most experienced event organizers uh, that we had in Germany and Michael being a, a very, very um, successful um, advertisement company owner. I don't know if that's a word, but I think you know what I mean. Um, yeah, we thought it might be a good triangle to to found uh, a company that is focused on on sports and sports events. Um, we had high rocks in the back of our heads back then, or rather Christian uh, had an idea. Um, but then, uh, yeah, we started and ever since, um, this is what I do, this is what we do. And, um, from, from that thought back in our heads, um, High Rocks became, became what it is today. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the, just, we don't need all the details. What's the ownership structure like? Is it, so it's you, Christian and Michael, owners of the company effectively, is it? <laughs> Um, we are, we have an investor that's a Swiss company called Infront, uh, very globally famous for sports rights and uh, also um, um, endurance competitions, other endurance competitions like a B2 run. They own a British company called Threshold that are organizing different um, sports events all over the UK. Uh, and some other, it's official, it's, it's all Infront. Again, is owned by Wonder Sports, the big Chinese giant. So um, that's the investment structure. They they own um, parts of the company, and the three of us do own the rest. Okay, okay. How's, how how have you found the transition from elite sport into into business? Has that been tough? Has it been easy? No, it's tough. I have to admit, it's tough. It's like. I, I'm I, usually I try to explain it like this. Um, when you do like when you're an elite athlete, your your day is structured. It's almost like being in school back in the days. You get up in the morning and you know exactly what you do next, and then you do what's on the schedule for that day, and then you at one and sometime you go to bed. That's basically how you live your life as a professional athlete. Um, then once that ended, um, that all ends. That's 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 it. So suddenly no one tells you what to do in the morning. No one tells you what to do after you got up in the morning. And and that counts for the entire day. So for me, it was and I can only say that now, like, you know, a few years later, because I didn't know then. But for me, it was very important to find something that basically can light my fire the way that being a professional athlete could. So something to get up in the morning, something to um, really work for, to spend more hours in the office than I want to. And uh, yeah, to stay away from family because I feel it's necessary and so on and so forth. And uh, it took me, it took me even with when we started High Rocks and the company, it, it took me probably like 18 months, I would say, until I really had this fire burning again. Um, so there was a transition time where, yeah, I also I was struggling getting up in the morning, going to the office because it felt a little bit like what is what is it worth? I mean, come on, um, you've done it all. But but yeah, I'm very, very happy today that I can say that that fire is absolutely burning. Uh, it's a different fire. Um, 
and the flame is to stay in that like you know to stay figuratively the flame is probably even a bigger flame than it was before but that's also because it's a field where um where i don't know everything yet in field hockey i know everything you could you know after 20 years you could ask me left and right and i can tell you give you the right answer on the pitch and off the pitch and here I'm still learning every day. We created a sport. So basically no one is an expert in this field yet. Mm -hmm. We're probably the biggest experts, but also even us, we only know this sport for four and a half years now. So um, yeah, so that's that's the uh, very long, sorry, answer to your question. Um, I, I found something that can light my fire again, and I'm very happy that that's good. the case. Good, good. So we're we're at the start of the the season, the twenty two twenty three season, as we record this. Um, can you talk about uh, like in, in numbers what 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 we're looking at for High Rocks for the upcoming season in terms of venues, athletes, the growth rate, things like that? Um, yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, we are depending a little bit on when this airs. We are uh, launching um, different new markets this year. Uh, we're gonna be in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we will launch uh, Hong Kong. Uh, we will launch um, Scandinavia. We already launched Scandinavia. Uh, we launched or are about to launch Greece um, and a few more uh, event cities in already existing markets. Um, I hope I didn't forget one of the new markets now, but uh, that's that's at least what I. What I have to, uh, top of my head right now, um, so that's probably the biggest the biggest change that we have more more countries, but also radically more events. Um, yeah, and then of course the the main driver to grow this sport globally is um, getting more particip participants and average to the events. Um, it's an incredible journey that we've done in the in the UK so far with like every event being sold out where sometimes we even ask ourselves why is that so different than in all other markets because we're not not like literally not doing anything different but it's just a very adaptive market and people uh, just like to be first movers and um uh, and the brits are a little bit more outgoing when it comes to fitness than obviously the rest of at least europe and the us is a different case because it's so big but um yeah, so we want to grow from roughly, I think, thirty-five or forty thousand participants in in the last season to eighty to ninety thousand in in the upcoming season, um, which has two effects because we're doing more events, but then also we want to <clears throat> grow the average number of participants per event. Uh, and the ultimate goal is uh, to grow this to a global sport, like an actual an actual sport, which is called fitness racing. And Hyrox is is hopefully the the main main um piece of of that sport okay. so i i asked um my followers b before this call like if they had any questions for you we've had a few come in which we'll get to but what but a few of them is uh, i often get is why aren't high rocks in x country you know why aren't, why aren't they in france why aren't they in ireland um can you can you give us like an insight into like some of the thought process about what makes you decide what country to go in next uh, and, and the venues that you choose well yeah of course i mean and that's very simple actually uh we want to be everywhere it's just that it's a it's just simply a business decision that you have to do the steps in the right way and uh we don't have unlimited funds and we don't have you know unlimited resources to just be everywhere at the same time so Eventually, we want to be in China, we want to be in Asia everywhere, we want to be in, in the oceanic countries, uh, we want to be in France and Italy, uh, and so on and so forth. We want to be in South America. It's just it's just a business decision to say where do we go at what time and also under what circumstances and what are the what are the uh, what's the structure, you know? So we we operate most countries ourselves, and then there are licensed countries like Spain, for example, is a licensed market where like people that we met, we knew or got to know, um, bought a license, a Hyrox license, and they are doing that on their own. They're doing that's their business. It's completely their P and L. And of course, they're, it's like a franchise, if you want. Of course, they have to stick to like the Hyrox CI, the rules, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, in order to be sanctioned also for world championships, qualification, and stuff. But 
um, these are the different models how we enter new markets and um, and uh, we if if the question is why are we not in France it's simple because Fra France is a very very difficult market for us because it's another language it's the language that no one in our company so far speaks so uh, we need to find people to actually operate that on site um, then also there are other issues with with the French market that when it comes to sports events but that's just too technical for now um, we will be there eventually, definitely. I bet next year, I, I would say next season. But um, it's it, same with Italy, for example. It's much easier for us to open uh, to open a new country like um, Switzerland or Austria, where you know we speak the same language. We can just go there basically and start. Or the UK, because English is then in a way the world's mother language. Um, so that's more simple for us, and that's why we went there. Uh, Holland, Scandinavia, also very simple uh, decisions for us because it's just across the border. Also, English is very, very simple there. You can you can do everything in English, um, which is not so much the case in Italy or France, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so long story short, um, the reason why we're, we are where we are and why we're not where people want us to be is simply that um, we're working on the structure. We want to be everywhere, but we have to do it at the right time. Okay. All right. Thank you. So you, you touched on the UK uh, and, and the popularity over there. And I was going to ask you why, why you think it's done so well. But um, would you ever consider moving to two day events? I, I, it, it seems like London is like well oversold. Like for example, look at a lot of people want to compete that can't. Would you consider two day events? Absolutely. Uh, we're not only considering it, um, we are definitely doing it. Uh, That's wow. going to happen. That's going to happen and it's going to happen soon. Okay. Oh, great. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just simply because of what you, you were just saying. I mean, um, it will then eventually be like, um, it's not going to be a two day event in terms of one day and then the next day, the same thing. We would, we would then split the categories. So for example, have doubles the one day and, you know, doubles and relay the one day and then the singles the next day or whatever. But, um, that's that's about to happen. Okay, excellent. All right, and I guess follows on nicely from that is uh, the most popular question that I had to ask you by far was: uh, are, are there any changes planned to to the format or, or new divisions, anything like that, uh, in the works? So, like in a two day event, would that facilitate a half hierox or a double hierox or, or something like that? Uh, any plans for that in the future? Um, so I would say yes and no, no, when it comes to changing the sport. Um, so we have the eight workouts and we have the eight K running mm -hmm. that's going to stick. And, um, until someone tells us for that, there's, that there's a, like a major reason why we can't do it like that anymore, like for whatever, you know, uh, then we, of course we might consider it if, if. I don't know if it's forbidden to do ski uh, for whatever reason uh, uh, globally, then of course we would change something like that. But this is our sport now. And we, we chose, we chose the the competitions or the workouts for a good reason. That's it. It is a much more sophisticated thought be process behind that than people think that has to do with like the, the you know, it has to be judgeable. It uh, had to be, uh, not dangerous even after you know some like a two-hour competition so people ask so why don't you have like box jumps in it or monkey bars or whatever and we basically have an answer for almost every workout there is uh, why it's not in there and uh, why those eight workouts are in there but so i would say no to that part of the question um we would i i don't think there there are no plans to ever change the sport if we don't have to for whatever reason um changing categories or getting new categories in uh, is something that we've been talking about from day one. Um, but, and I, I, I'm always trying to explain that. Uh, and I hope that, that especially like the high rocks community understands currently we are, um, growing the sport and, um, like in a, from a global, from a global view, no one in the world knows high rocks, right? So this is like a zero point, whatever percentage of, of the, people in the world and even of the fitness people in the world. So we're trying to educate people that this exists. And um, 
uh, we are very convinced that the amount of categories we have right now lowered the air entry barrier due to the fact that we have like relays and doubles. This lowers the entry barrier. It's very accessible once people understand it, but we have to be very careful that we don't overload the like the newbies, people that have never heard of high rocks with like co communicate because you cannot just have another category. You then have to communicate it. And if we start communicating nine different things like a half high rocks or ultra high rocks or whatever, I'm very sure that in the future we will have these categories. We will have a half high rocks. We will have an outdoor high rocks. We will have a ultra high rocks, stuff like that. But for now, our main objective is growing this audience of people that know about high rocks and therefore i am very convinced as like globally responsible for marketing that we chose the right categories for now that we want to distribute as much as we can okay makes sense um so, so on the same topic with new york is in two days as we record this there's a there's an outdoors track for that would you consider that a one-off because of venue limitations or something like that it's not something that we're going to expect to see more and more of in, in the next few years well i would say if we have the choice we would always stick to our indoor setup if we don't have the choice for whatever reason because venues are not big enough or uh just like in new york um in meadowlands we have this situation that we can only like fit like the amount of people that that are coming now it's sold out since today so um with like i think that's like 1500 people there it's a small hall small venue uh we might always try to find solutions like that but i would answer to that that it's not our goal to like mix that up um so what we will and again, we're very young still. What we will have to decide in the future is we have to analyze the data, see the running times and see what happens in order to decide whether we can have these events as being a qualification event for world championships, for example. Yeah. Because um, it's absolutely possible that we will have an event one day in like an outdoor event, let's say uh, in Greece. And we just say we do it, but you cannot qualify for world championships because it's just not comparable enough. But there, I also hope that people give us a little time because we need to figure that out for ourselves first. We never tried it. I don't know. I can't. I cannot tell you if the running times on Saturday will be very much different from uh, the running times we usually usually have. If that's the case, then we will definitely talk about it and we will make our our call for the future. Just like we have the same discussions, you know this. Uh, with slats or with new carpets or whatever. We always have to, we, we're missing two years of data due to COVID. We are trying to get that data in. And once we have all that data and we tested it like three or four times, then we will make the calls. When to change the carpets? Can we run outside? Does it have to be indoors? Um, is the rock zone, do we have to work on the rock zone? So I'm whenever I'm, I read these discussions, like mostly on like social or whatever, I'm actually happy about it because I think a good sports sport needs this these discussions. If no one cares about it, then it's not a professional sport, never. So I'm very happy about these conversations and I, re I read them all. I usually don't try to interact, but I read them all. And But I, I can just say, we need a little bit more time to analyze the data, to make the right call uh, regarding all these, like, you know, race, um, race, um, the race structure or the different forms that we can can offer um but we are very very much looking at that and uh, we take this very seriously okay cool um just going back you you, you talked about uh, the creation of of the concept and all the work that went behind it and so on four years in are you are you happy with 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 what you decided back at the time are, are, are there any regrets anything like you wish you could change now but maybe it's too late you know um, well, that's a good question. I never thought about it. It's like, well, I would say, would I change anything? I sometimes wonder if we, um, be, just from doing it myself, I sometimes wonder if the, if like we did the 100% right, right decision regarding the farmer's carry, uh, cause I just feel it's, 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 it's not the same flow than all the other workouts. So 
there. It's it's very short. It's run. It's almost also running. Like it's running, running, and then running again. So sometimes I feel like there, we maybe we could have been a little bit more creative. Um, but that's uh, look. That's uh, also complaining on a very high level because I also like the pictures of people like really struggling. And we cannot forget we are talking about. Um, of course, always about the top athletes. They don't care about the farmer's carry because they are walking around with that basically during a normal day. But the, the average Joe um, who had who never had a kettlebell like that in their hands, uh, for that for those people, it's still a very, very tough, tough thing to do. So um, yeah, looking at it from different angles, I would say we could have been a little bit more creative there, but uh, overall, I'm very happy with the workouts we chose. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, actually. I've, I've analysed some data on a couple of races now where I've looked at someone's performance on each of the exercises and how that correlates to their, their finish position. And farmer's carriers was actually like one of the greater predictors of someone's finishing position over and above a lot of the other exercises, which quite surprised me. And maybe those races were a bit of a one-off, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a good indicator, actually. Um, um what 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 do what what are you struggling with as a business? Like we talked about, you're obviously growing very quickly. And I guess COVID was a huge struggle for the business. But is there anything right now that is trouble? You know, yeah. I mean, COVID is still a topic in Germany, for example. Um, we're still people are still. The, it's not so much. COVID itself that like millions of people are staying at home, but it's just the, I think what I can say globally is the consumer um, behavior, uh, the consumer behavior due to the war in Europe, due to uh, increasing uh, interest and um, the inflation. I think that all leads to a not very welcoming user behavior overall uh globally and uh we can see that people think twice before they buy their ticket for a hundred bucks to an event um especially in the markets where it's not sold out they wait until the last minute because first of all they might even think uh, let's see if it happens we still have covid we ha still have this war situation here whatever happens um so you see that people are not buying that ticket as early as they used to um, this does not count for the sold out events in the UK, but that's a rare exception, I have to say. So, yeah, we still struggle very much with the consumer behavior globally. And um, and I, I, can, I, I only hope that that this ends uh, for 23 because, I mean, not only because of us, obviously, because of the trouble we have in the world right now. Um, it's time to have a year without one of those. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, from a, a, a competition perspective, in terms of competition for your business, th th does that concern you in any way? Like, uh, there are obviously competitors to a certain extent, and presumably, if you're successful and continue to grow, there'll be more and more people coming into the market. Does, is that a concern? Uh, zero, and I tell you why, and not because not not from a like cocky perspective, but. Um, we created a sport. I'm very convinced that it was us creating the sport of fitness racing. Everyone else who's doing a sport that is playing in the field of fitness racing now is in the end just helping us growing the sport of fitness racing. And I'm very much convinced that, and that's why I don't see a single competitor. And I, again, I don't mean that there are not other companies that are doing this good or well. I don't know. I have no idea. But I don't even care because if someone is doing another fitness race, eventually that person is interested or, or sorry, apparently that person is interested in fitness racing in a way. So that person will, if he or she never heard of Hyrox before, will somehow hear about Hyrox in the after the, after whatever race he or she did. So what I'm saying is that's marketing for us in the end, because then they hear about Hyrox or they will definitely hear about Hyrox. And our job is to then be the better product and convince these people to stick to our sport or to our to our race and not to the other one. 
So I, I literally say like, I hope there will be many more other fitness races, races popping up, helping us to spread the world about fitness rate word about fitness racing. And then our job is to be the best fitness race out there and to keep people in our community. And besides it's absolutely possible in a, in a, whatever in Dallas, Texas, it's possible as long as these events are not on the same day, it's absolutely possible to do three fitness races or four a year. There's no point in calling this a competition. This is different than Ironman, right? So you, you cannot do like 15 Ironmans in a year. But Hyrox races or fitness races, I think you can do you can do quite a few if you want it in a year. So um, and I'm saying this every single time, and I hope people believe me because I honestly think that there is no competition whatsoever. It's like if people want to do another race, they should do another race. If, and then they will hear about us and they have to make that call. If they like the other race better, then we did a shit job. We have, we are, we have the, like, we really want to be the best fitness rate race out there. And we are so far, we are convinced we are, but we will always be very, very critical with ourselves checking if we're still the best one and, uh, and, and trying to grow and, and be better every single season. Makes sense. I think uh, I was thinking about, I've got so many questions about, will they change the format? Um, and I thought it was kind of strange in a way because like, the standardized format is something that I love about it. I love being able to compare my time against previous times and so on. Uh, and I think I think maybe people just love High Rocks, the execution of High Rocks, the branding, the, the community and everything like that. They kind of, they, they, they do want to stay within that and maybe adapt, uh, adapt their races, to, you know, change things up every now and then. But, still within hierarchs because of like the way you guys have executed it and and the whole community around it. it was it was uh sort of my interpretation of why we had so many questions around whether you were going to change the format or not you know yeah look um we we also get these questions and um, i mean i have no idea who asked you that those questions but if we look at the data of the people that are asking these questions it's in like Eight of ten, eight, eight of ten times, that's people from the CrossFit community, because these that community is so much used to these yearly changes of the decisive workouts for the games or the Open. So, and I totally understand that. But if you look at every other sport in the world, it's like in triathlon, <laughs> no one would say, "Oh, let's stop swimming next year. Let's go rowing or whatever." You know what I mean? It's like. Or tennis, they, they've been playing over that stupid net for hundreds of years. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is like the, all the legit sports that you see in whatever Olympics or like, you know, these sports, of course, adapt stuff and change rules and, and look that it's compatible, uh, co co competitive and um, that it's still accessible and yeah, that you grow your grassroots and so on and so forth. And then you might change some stuff for the kids and, and whatever, whatsoever. But you will not see... Uh, like a professional whatever American football game suddenly being played over three days or you know where I'm trying to get at. And we want to be that professional sport. So there's no there's no plan in in really changing the workouts and because we very much believe that it, it doesn't make sense because our USP in the end is that all successful global globally successful sports work exactly the way you just explained that you have your time you have the challenge with yourself because you can compare your time from last time with your current time. Uh, you can, you can talk with people about it. You can, I mean, I always say this, what's the first question you ask a maid if uh, he ran a marathon? The first question you ask that person after the race is what was your time? There's no doubt about it. That will be the very first question. And it doesn't matter. And the funny thing is, it doesn't matter what the answer is because if he answers, if he, if he tells you it's two hours, 35 minutes, you're like, wow, fucking hell. That's amazing. If he, if he goes like four hours, 30, you'll go like, Oh wow, that's amazing. Right. It's because yeah. it's individual. It's very yeah. subjective. So our goal is to bring people to run fitness races. And then that's the most important part from a retention perspective, keep them in the system, make them want to be, want to get better, make them train for it, make them actually saying high rocks is my sport. My sport is high rocks mm -hmm. and I'm not a fitness enthusiast or whatever. I'm not doing fitness. 
my sport is fitness racing. My sport is high rocks. That's that's what that's what we want to achieve. Okay, cool. So that that, that leads me on to, to my next question. I was going to ask you about the, the elite side of the sport. Like it is a sport for everyone. You've done a great job with that. But from the elite perspective, uh, where do you see that going? Like, do you see it as a professional sport with professional high rocks athletes in the future that can potentially earn a living from from this? Is that is that your vision? Well. Um, uh, yes, I, I would say absolutely. Um, although then again, I have to say that I, I I very much think that these elite athletes will always also compete in other competitions. So that will pro- most definitely not be like high rocks only, um, but they will do other fitness races or running as it's happening already or, uh, yeah. uh, you know, obstacle races or whatever, which is absolutely fine. But I, I very much believe that these elite elite, um, elite uh, athletes, they will that will grow over the next years very much. So uh, we will have prize money stuff, not only at the World Championships. And um, I, I see this uh, becoming bigger also through medialization and uh, because that's that's a TV show. I, I 100% believe that this, this elite race is, that's what I want to see on TV. That's a one hour telly show. Um, where you have amazing athletes battling like head to head. That's as far as I'm concerned, that's exactly what telly needs nowadays. Uh, it's a great format. So, and we're working on that. Um, so I see this growing, but again, every big sport in the world needs a professional scene, right? Needs people that do this professionally, the professionally, and that you can talk about, but that's, even in our events, that's like not even 0.001% of the participants. So, Doing that split for us is very, very difficult um, to send the right messages because you want to talk about Hunter McIntyre, but then again, you want to don't want to scare off people that then think, oh my God, if that guy's doing it, I don't even touch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've been conscious of that myself with, with what I'm doing at Rock's Life. Like I talk about the elites a lot, but then I'm also conscious that like there's a lot of beginners and I, I, I don't want to put them off, you know? So yeah, uh, uh, yeah it's a balancing act. Um, and then you, you talked about the elite races. There's, so there's elite races as well at the European Championships and North American Championships this year as well, right? And there's prize money for those, is there? Yes. Okay, okay. Um. I've heard you talk in the past about the Olympics as well. Is that is that still an aspiration for the sport? One hundred percent. I mean, uh, I've been sitting in uh, Lausanne with Thomas Bach and uh, talking about it already. It's like it's not. It's it's really not a question of do we want it or not. It's rather you have to have the right setup as a sport in order to be able to basically go into the Olympics. That has to do with like global accessibility to a sport that has to do with like federational setup. And we don't have that yet. So it is an absolute aspiration, but um, at the, again, at the right time, um, maybe the Olympics change their logic. And one day they make, make um, Olympics, the Olympics accessible for event sports like ours, because I mean, they're talking about esports or e-gaming. They're talking about stuff like that. Right. So maybe one day they will decide to say, okay, Let's put a race like a fitness race like this into the Olympics. And then suddenly we can access it a lot easier. But right now we have the aspiration, but then also we don't have the objective to like build a global federation at this point and start, you know, setting stuff like that up, which is way too complicated. In the end, it's also true that we are a business driven company and, and, and not a sports federation. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so the world championships is in Manchester this year. Um, can you talk about any like specific plans for that? Um, you know, what we might expect to see and, and what sort of drove the choice to choose Manchester over somewhere else? Well, we were pretty convinced that it has to be in the UK in this season um, due to the fact we discussed before the amazing success there. And uh, as we already uh, had the plan to do two London events in uh, this season, one will be uh, announced, uh, I think, when this podcast airs. At least I think it's Monday. <laughs> so um, uh, that's that's the that's the big news. Then um, uh, we already had London, and then we had a very good deal with Manchester, where we lo- just literally loved the uh, the arena. Um, it's it's very beautiful, and uh, we fell in love with with the arena and and thought it 
could be a great second um second i would say i'm saying because of this new format and setup now uh world championships after the vegas world championships uh that's that's the pure reason for for manchester okay excellent all right uh in terms of the 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 gym affiliations like high rocks affiliations uh is that uh is that a big focus for you within the business? Is it something that you're trying to trying to grow? Um, is it something that you think will will drive growth in the number of competitors and so on? Yeah. Look, the funny thing is, we have nowadays we're talking about digital marketing online. Everybody's looking at their phones, right? And and every every like product that is trying to sell stuff is trying to reach you through your whatever social media. Uh, uh, um, social media profiles or the way you surf through the web. And we started doing high rocks. And of course we did the same thing, started pushing out, you know, uh, like advertisement digitally and so on and so forth, performance oriented marketing. And suddenly we realized, why are we doing this? I mean, of course you have to do it in a way, but our entire target audience is like sitting or not sitting, but is, is in these gyms. They are in these gyms. So, like very simply spoken, but if we speak to every single gym in the world, then we reach our target group 100%. And basically without throwing away money out of the window because people just click through it or swipe or whatever, you know? So our goal is to talk to as many gyms as we possibly can and try to try to convince them that High Rocks is an amazing healthy, amazing, healthy form of training and which they all might more or less already do in a way. But then again, we give them another goal why their members should go to the gym because they can take part in a race that they don't even know exists. So we we very much talk about this filling a void that people do not know exists. And uh, that's that's difficult because if you don't know that something exists it's very hard to like you know to yeah. ask for it or to think about it and um but we're trying to explain that to people that we're creating a sport that um, is the why to another why to your question why should i go to the gym this is the answer or one of the answers and um and yeah that's why we that's why we uh, the gyms are really almost our main objective when it comes to um, marketing activities, which is funny because everything else nowadays is digital and suddenly yeah. they're seeing very much offline, which I actually like a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And has it been going? Is it is there good growth in the numbers there that you're seeing? This is also funny. Uh, I mean, because it's, it is in Europe, it is in the US, it's not so much in the UK which is funny because then again, we have the biggest success there. So it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to read the data at this point. And, um, uh, but there is a absolute correlation in all other markets when it comes to uh, gym affiliations and the amount of gyms where we have PFTs and stuff like that and participants. There's a very, very clear correlation, except in the UK. Okay. I guess that might be partly just due to the size of the market, the size of the country. Maybe it's, it's more condensed, maybe word spreads easier, something like that. Um, on a similar theme, like the, the PFTs, is that is that another driver of, of growth for you? Do you have plans to, to change the PFTs in the future, anything like that? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question because uh, we, we are discussing this internally a lot. Okay. Um, let me phrase it like this. Um, the PFTs are uh, our, um, how you say that, try our, um, uh, that's, that's how we try to get into gyms and convince people to have their first touch point with our sport because they don't have to sign up for the big one. They don't have to pay money. We go there. We do a fun workout with them. We explain them a little bit what our idea is. And hopefully then they like to, they follow us on Instagram and try to figure out more about High Rocks. Um, for those who are already familiar with the product, for them, it's a great training session. I did one this morning. Um, it's like, you know, um, it's exhausting. It's a good good 20 minute, whatever workout where you where you can just, you know, get high intensity stuff in. So um, I would... This, but this is not a program that's set in stone forever. Absolutely not. I would say um, 
It's also at the moment that we kept it for the upcoming season due to the comparability uh, of the first um, for people who did it in the first season that you can again say, oh, I improved because I, I'm now two minutes faster or whatever. Um, but I don't see this being the same setup forever. That's that's different to the actual event. All right. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking before the call, I've, uh, I don't think I've ever spoken to an Olympic gold medalist before. So I was like, <laughs> what, what, what should I ask while I've got the opportunity? Um, so I, I, I wait to ask, what do you feel is the one or two or three like traits that, that maybe you possess that someone else who maybe has similar natural ability in hockey uh, d- doesn't have that made you more successful? You know, is it, is it, is there anything that springs to mind certain traits that you feel are, are necessary to succeed at that level in, in sport? Huh. Well, I mean, I've, there's one thing that is, but that's very like in-depth nerd hockey talk. Um, I had one particular skill that I think I was I was exceptionally good at, um, uh, which had more was not really technical. It was rather kind of the overview on the pitch. I I, I had a I had a whatever like a, I could I could see things that not many could would see like passes and stuff if you know what I mean. But that's as I said a little bit too in depth. Uh, hockey nerdy, uh, nerdy. Um, I would say I have two things. One is, um, but that's absolutely not unique. And uh, I, I guess many, many um, professional athletes have that. But I have a very, very um, unbreakable confidence and confidence and optimism mism in um, reaching my goals and striving forward and uh, never giving up and. Um, going through very deep holes and high over high mountains. And then in the end, trying to reach what I set myself as a goal. Um, I think that dedication is counts for many professional athletes, but I know a few, and uh, I know that that's something that people feedback me that um, they love the fact that I would never give up, not in a game, not in a preparation tournament, not in the build up to a season or whatever. So I would say that's that's one. And the other thing is I always loved bringing people together and trying to form an optimal or like the, trying to get the best out of a group of people. So um, I played in, in the Indian Hockey League for four seasons, which is like very famous in, in the world of field hockey. And uh, people came together and our team consisted of like nine different nations. And um, and you had to bring these together. I was the captain of the team and we became champions in the first year and in the third year again, in the fourth year also. So, And people then more or less called me like the Indian whisperer because I was one of the only players to be able to, you know, connect these religions, these people with all the other players from all the other countries. So I would say that I'm... I'm a I'm a decent team leader and I can I can work with people and I I I like listening and I like figuring out what are the different approaches of our colleagues nowadays. What how do I need to talk to the one person compared to the other person? Um there's different messaging and so on and so forth. So uh sorry, I, I don't want to talk so much about myself. That that's but you asked. So these are the these are the things that I that I think I'm quite okay at. All right, thank you. Um, I've just got one, one or two more questions, if that's okay. Um, but b- before I do those, when, when I've been on podcasts in the in the past, I've I've often come off of it and thought, I wish I wish they'd asked me that question. Um, so before we finish, I want to ask: is it is there any questions you wish I'd ask? And maybe there's not. Uh, yeah, no. Um, it's not so much that I I, I was hoping for a question to be asked, but um let me just let me just say that um uh because as i said i'm i'm listening to a lot uh, i just want to emphasize again on what i said before that uh we are so much depending on all that feedback out there and you know getting the information of people that are brand new to high rocks that are familiar with the brand for the last 5 years and from the start and um figuring out what's like construct uh, <laughs> 
a con how you, uh, damn missing words most of the constructive time. Constructive criticism. Like, constructively like working, thank you, working on um developing the product and getting, as I said, getting better every season. And uh, sometimes um uh sometimes I have the feeling that people forget um that that how young the sport is and that we're still trying to improve and that we're not sitting in our in our high tower uh, looking down at the high rocks world saying uh dance puppets dance that's absolutely not the case we are trying to develop the product every day we're investing a lot of money still into this product and we really want to make this happen and um but therefore we need the community we need the community to work with us to help us um uh with feedback of course if you give feedback you cannot necessarily expect that that means that everything's changed the way people feedback it but we are listening very closely to everything and uh we will we are talking about it daily we have our our working groups for every single workout every single department and um and yeah that's what i appreciate a lot because that got bigger over the last 18 months that we received more feedback we went more into conversations with people that are familiar with the brand so yeah that's that's the one thing I wanted to emphasize again on. Yeah, sure. Um, as as someone that's come from elite level of sport, I, I put a post on our Instagram the other week about who people thought from the world of sport could potentially break the world records that, that we've got at the moment um, in, in the men and women's pro division. Anyone spring to mind for you? Yeah, and I know the answer um, because... Um, it's it's no one uh and i'm i i tell you why not be, it's it this is a different sport this is like people think oh is the we see this i don't know if you if you read the comments under our youtube documentation of the world championships where we have like a bunch of crossfit people saying that this we are so shit because matt fraser would kill us and uh, hunter would be very bad at crossfit you know and he 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 lost in the first round at the games that one year or what it's whatever and i'm saying yes he did and you know what he would also suck at field hockey and uh you know because it's a different sport it's an absolutely different sport it's just a fun fact that we created a sport that apparently fits the 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 skills of hunter very well that's why currently he's the best in the world and Matt Fraser would not beat Hunter in High Rocks. And by the way, that's not me saying that. Matt Fraser said that. So, um, you know, I'm. it's not like, uh, and that's why I believe that if Jan Frodeno, the uh, world Ironman champ, probably the best Ironman athlete in the world, if he would start working on the slats and start really training for High Rocks, being a little stronger, um, you know, and being able to run fast after such a such a tough tough um, workout like the sleds or whatever, then that would be competition, I would say. But he would need like a year to prepare for it. So, um, and there 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 might be other athletes from other sports that um, where the same would count. But if you if the question is from what other sport could someone sign up tomorrow and join the race in Chicago, the US championships and beat Hunter, I say no one. Okay. In, in, in fairness, the, the, the question that I put up was given four months to specifically train for it. Um, okay. And, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Then uh, if it's four months to specifically train for it, I would say um, it's that in four months, I would say only someone from the like intensively running community, like Iron Man, because everyone was like people. Many people said footballers um, uh, when we talked about it, but I don't believe they are able to get the running in in four months the mm -hmm. way they would need to because they have to run the kilometer in three minutes twenty in average, and I I highly doubt they would be able to do that. Um, so four months, yeah. If Jan Frodeno would do nothing else but working on the slats and the, and the wall balls for the next four months, he would have a small shot. <laughs> okay, All right. maybe one day. Yeah. Uh, are you are you competing this year? Will we see you a, a race? Absolutely. I mean, I obviously I'm coming from a team sports background, so 
I found my sport in the double competition, I have to say. I enjoy that so much. I, I think it's an amazing format. I did it a couple of times this year already with um, my brother and a friend. And I will compete at least twice uh, this year still. And then in 23, definitely again. But the doubles is, that's my that's my game. I like that. All right, excellent. All right, well, um, thank you for your time today. I've I've, I've, I've no more questions for you. Uh, so I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate what you've created, what, you, what you're doing with Hyrox. Um, we love it. Even, even if some people moan about it uh, and have criticisms, um, we love it. So uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, any anything any any final messages that you want to want to put out before we go? Yeah, no. Also, Greg. I mean, thank you. Also, uh, I really appreciate what you do. Um, this is also part of um, yeah for me part of the success story of a sport. If people start more or less organically, like thinking about the sport and um, trying to make the sport better and finding their their um, yeah their way how to communicate with the community and I. I very much hope that many people are listening and that, uh, I mean, you were there first. So hopefully in a few years, this is like the biggest, the, the biggest podcast in the, in the fitness racing world. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hope so. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. You're welcome. Thanks, Greg. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Appreciate it.